And now, broadcasting live from the restaurant at the end of the universe, this is the history of the Atlantic world. Hello and welcome to Horses, Land, Slaves, and the Tsetse Fly, episode 1.4 of Rise of the Conquistadors. I'm your host, Jesse Wiest, and thank you for tuning in. Now, last episode, we documented the life of the Infante Don Henrique, uh, and we really fleshed out a lot of the motivation, I think, that both he and the Portuguese crown, as well as the Fidalgos that were sent to Africa, shared. Um, as their voyages to Africa in search of golden slaves began to put into motion a lot of the processes that are coming together in the 1400s that are really building a new world. Um, today we're going to pick back up with that tale, of course, though we're going to be speaking a lot less about the Portuguese in general, and even less than that about Henrique specifically. Um, we're going to pick back up next episode with Zurara's Chronicle, and I'll be uh, returning to talking about uh, the Portuguese conquistadors who operated in the African Atlantic in the 15th century. And also next episode, we're going to fully introduce Catamasto, who voyaged to Africa under the auspices of Henrique toward the end of the infant's life. And his accounts are great because they flesh out a lot more of the workings uh, of the early Atlantic world. Uh, but today, uh, we are switching gears. Um, and we're going to look at things from the African perspective. Now, Zurara and Catamasto will still be helpful since they provide us with early uh, written accounts by Europeans of the West Africans. But we're not examining European sources today to tell a story of the conquistadors. Rather, we are going to glean what we can from the Portuguese chroniclers to help us better understand their trading partner, partners in Africa. Now, before we get to that, there's a couple of things we need to take care of first. Uh, a bit of housekeeping, if you will. Now, I have mentioned, I think, in other episodes, that while we have a small social media presence, uh, I have, I'm sure, done a pretty lousy job of mentioning them on a consistent basis. And um, so I think I'm going to do so now. You can follow along with the History of the Atlantic World podcast on Facebook if you want. Uh, we're at, at Atlantic World History, all one word. You can also follow me on Twitter at Atlantic1492. And I have finally figured out that I think the best way for me to put up maps um, that correspond with different episodes is to make an Instagram account and just post the maps there. Uh, now, I've done that a little bit, and they aren't great quality. They're literally just pictures I took with my phone out of books that I'm using to help me write the podcasts. But the idea is that uh, my dear brother, or perhaps some other artist whom I can wrangle into this if for some reason he tells me no, uh, anyway, will use those maps and will create more colorful and descriptive maps so that I don't have the ugliest Instagram account on planet Earth. Now, at any rate... You can follow me on Instagram by searching for Atlantic World Podcast, all one word. Now, as soon as I figure this out a little better, I'm going to share those links to the pictures on Twitter and Facebook. Um, or you can simply follow the podcast on Instagram if you prefer to look at the maps that way. Uh, now, as while I'm at it, uh, I, of course, host the episodes on SoundCloud. So you can always find the, the episodes there. That's at soundcloud.com backslash Atlantic World. 
Though, as I am sure most of you are probably aware, the episodes are also available on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and a variety of other platforms. Now, I'd like to give a special shout-out to one of our listeners on Twitter who reminded me to tell you uh, all to please review the podcast on iTunes or whatever platform you are using because numerous uh, good reviews is really going to be hands down the best way for the audience to grow, which is what I would like to happen. So thank you for taking the time to do this, if you can. Now, one final bit of promotion, if you don't mind. I'd also like to thank those who have contributed to the podcast Patreon page. I appreciate your support immensely. Uh, Of course, episodes of this podcast will always be free, but you are welcome to donate to the podcast as well. Um, I'd ask for maybe a dollar a month, which once I'm making a bit of revenue, we can... I can produce more episodes more frequently. And at any rate, I'm hoping that would translate, a dollar a month would translate into uh, maybe a dollar an episode uh, in the future. Um, at any rate, you can find a link to the Patreon page on the podcasts uh, on, our, on my other social media platforms or by going directly to patreon.com backslash Atlantic World. Uh, now on to the other point of order. I need to make a couple of corrections about episodes 1.1 and episodes 1.2. Um, a couple of folks from the amazing community at Historum.com were able to help me out. Um, now, if you remember, Tariq, he who first led a raiding party against the Visigoths way back in the year 711 and episode 1.1 in our hearts, and for whom the Rock of Gibraltar is named, well, I I should have properly noted that Tariq was a Berber, not an Arab. Uh, And maybe more importantly, or at least this is something I was more frequently incorrect about, is that I referred in that episode to Al-Andalus as Andalusia, and sometimes described people or places as Andalusian. And that was wrong. Uh, If I'm not going to use Al-Andalus, which would have been the Arabic name, then I probably should have been using the Spanish name, which was Andalusi. So, while we're speaking of the names of medieval states, too, one other error I'd like to point out. Asturias, I briefly mentioned... uh, that uh, early princi- or excuse me, that early place, it is not a principality. I called it the Principality of Asturias, and it should be probably properly be called the Kingdom of Asturias. Now, as for episode 1.2, uh, just to make some clarifications, the Guanche on Gran Canary, the nobility wore long hair, the plebeians short hair, and the poor folks subjected to work in taboo professions such as that of butcher actually had to shave their heads. Now, I mentioned that the natives of Huerta Ventura, also uh, speaking of the Guanche, I mentioned that they were, quote, more urban than the natives of other islands, and that's wrong. Now, in my defense, I think I pulled that directly from the authors of Le Canarian, who likely said it, to be honest, just as a justification as for the invasion, something along the lines of, well, we should invade Fuerteventura because the natives there love the idea of being janitors in European towns, you know, uh, really. So, at any rate, thank you to the fine community of folks at Historum.com, especially the knowledgeable uh, knowledgeable users, Frank81 and Tullius. Now, I have moved into a new... uh, recording studio, if you will, and this place is a little quieter, so hopefully you're noticing the audio is going to be a little bit improved as well. Uh, Anyway, now, when I was a toddler, my father, uh, for a time, started taking me to Dunkin' Donuts with him. And after a week of going to Dunkin' Donuts every day, he stopped taking me to Dunkin' Donuts. Now, as you might imagine... My family became very worried after this because I stopped eating. And nothing they tried worked. Peas and carrots? What do I look like? Bananas? Get the hell out of here. In the time, uh, I had become so completely addicted to sugar that as a result of me not going to get my donuts in the morning, I just stopped eating altogether for a couple of days. And finally, though, my grandmother offered me a piece of pound cake, which I immediately devoured, satisfying the little sugar demon inside of me. And I think that might be the reason why I've always remembered uh, this Dunkin' Donuts commercial from my youth, whereupon 
One donut maker says to another sleeping donut maker before sunrise, uh, Lenny, get up. It's time to make the donuts. Or something like that. I, I mean, his name might have been Larry. I'm sorry to inform you that the editor is still on vacation. Now, even at the young age of two or three, as I was, when I, I, I learned and knew enough then, after basically a week's worth of visits to Dunkin' Donuts, the donuts were amazing. And I even had favorite kinds of donuts. I was basically a donut expert. Well, I mean, sort of. Because what I knew about donuts, I thought a lot, was still a lot less than what, say, somebody like Lenny, or Larry, or, or whoever, and, and the, the other baker, whatever they knew. I knew which donuts were which just by looking at them. And I knew my favorite kinds of donuts, and I could have told you all about what they tasted like, and looked like, and smelled like. But Lenny, and the other baker, well, they knew how to make donuts. And that's a different level of understanding altogether. You see, and, and, and I bring this up because making history and making donuts really aren't all that different. They're both things that are crafted by the work of human beings and are meant to be consumed by human beings. Now, to be truthful, baking is more of a science than history, which is uh, more of an art. Uh, now, obviously, baking can be taken to an art form. Uh, any cake shop uh, can show that. Now, likewise, so too can history be made more scientific, with statistics, archaeological evidence, DNA testing. But baking recipes, however, can be tested. Historians must take facts from the past and combine these with primary sources to create a narrative. We call this process historiography, the, the, the act of crafting history, of making the sausage, or, um, well, I guess, making the donut. Now, the narratives or histories that historians create, they can't really be tested in the same way that a recipe can be tested. We don't have time machines. So to take a familiar example from American history, uh, George Washington, you could read a book about George Washington, wherein a, the historian argues that his brilliant leadership during the Revolutionary War is the reason that the American colonies won their independence. And then after that, you could read another book about George Washington, where the historian argued that the American colonies won their independence despite George Washington's poor leadership, leading to loss after loss against the British army. Now, both of these historians would be using the same set of facts to create narratives. And I think George Washington went three for eight. Um, or three and eight, I, I don't remember at any rate. They would be using the same set of facts uh, to create narratives that we could not test by going back in time to see which one of them is right. So, historians argue a lot. The who, the what, and the when. Often in crafting history. These are known facts. But the why and the how are not entirely known. Now, next episode, we're going to turn, like I said, fully to our sources. But these sources, as all of our early sources are, are European, and that doesn't make them bad in and of, in and of itself, but it, it does mean that they share certain biases. And that means it's harder for us to decode the past more fully. Because none of the Europeans who go to Africa in the 1400s, uh, for example, they, none of them really understand how the governments there work, except from within the framework work of their understanding of feudal monarchies. So using this as an example, they really struggle in, in trying to describe how African political systems work, because not all of them are monarchies. And that's exactly why I thought this episode was so important. Now, with that said, before we turn our attention fully to the political and economic history of Africa, which is a daunting task if I've ever attempted one, 
I'm not going to wait until next episode to turn fully to our sources. We desperately need to introduce the African economic and political background that forms part of the Atlantic world. But first, I want to know what what of the people themselves who lived in West Africa, the vast majority of whom were not kings or wealthy merchants or nobles. We don't have many written sources to tell us about sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look at the maps I've put up on Instagram, you can see that the distribution of states and even many states in Africa doesn't even line up uh, quite with the distribution of the various ethnic groups in the area. And so it's, it's really, it's, it's very tougher. Um, and frankly, we're not going to be able to fully flesh out the peoples of sub-Saharan Africa uh, more fully until I am eventually able to return um, to the changes in Atlantic and Africa in, in say, the, the, the 16th century in a later series in the podcast. But that doesn't mean we can't start. And so this is the real impetus behind me getting on Instagram before coming out with this episode, because um, by looking at those maps about West Africa, which I found in the way in John Thornton's Africa and Africans and the Making of the Atlantic World, um, if you look at those maps and what you see is that Western Sub-Saharan Africa was a very, very culturally and politically diverse place. So... With that out of the way, I'm going to introduce you to John Fernandez. He was a squire in the court of Dom Henrique, and in his youth, Fernandez was captured in the Mediterranean. He spent about a year of his life with the Moors before he was ransomed back to Portugal, and during this time, he learned how to speak Arabic. Later, he journeyed with some other conquistadors to the West African coast and decided to remain there in Africa at Arguam Bay. And when the others returned to Portugal, he ended up spending seven months in Africa before he uh, made his way back. And so through him, we have a little bit of knowledge about the Azanagwe people who lived in the coastal settlements of Northwest Africa. Zurara, who writes the tale of John Fernandez, tells us that the region contained few fortified towns in contrast with uh, the Mediterranean side of North Africa. And in fact, it seems that most of the people whom John Fernandez would encounter weren't even quite exactly residents of any single spot, but instead were merchants and others involved in the trans-Saharan trade. Zarara states that, quote, the whole land is generally peopled, but their mode of living is in tents and carts such as we use here in Portugal when our princes happen to go upon a warlike march. In addition, their principal study and toil is in guarding their flocks, to wit cows and sheep and goats and camels, and they change their camp almost every day. For the longest they rest in one spot is eight days. Some of their chief men breed horses, though very few. Unquote. Of their diet... Fernandez says that they ate meat and seeds and millet and drank lots and lots of milk. He adds that those, uh, although, uh, with that said, those who lived near the seashore ate almost nothing but fish. Wheat, too, was consumed whenever it was available by trade, um, not a crop that was easily grown in the desert, that's for sure. The clothes they wore were leather vests and breeches, though some of the more honorable wore bornices, and some preeminent men had good garments like the other Moors, and good horses and good saddles and stirrups. The woman, the women, excuse me, wore burnaces, which were like mantles, and covered their faces, though they would leave their bodies quite naked. The wives of the most honorable men also wore rings of gold in their nostrils and ears, as well as other jewels. Now, in addition to the words of John Fernandez, we have another excellent source on the people of Africa. Alois de Cadamasto, a Venetian trader who sailed to Africa under the banner of the Infante in the late 1450s. Now, during his stop at Arguem, a decade after Fernandez, Cadamasto took note of the people in the area. Quote, 
They are all Mohammedans and very hostile to Christians. They never remain settled, but are always wandering over these deserts. They live on dates, barley, and camel's milk. In addition, they trade with the land of the blacks to obtain millet and certain vegetables upon which they can support themselves. These same Azanagwe have a, sa- have a strange custom, Kanamasto also reports, uh, talking of the custom of face shielding. They always wear a handkerchief on the head of the flap, which with which they bring across their face, covering the mouth and part of the nose. For they say the mouth is a brutish thing, that it is always uttering wind and bad odors, so that it should be kept covered and not displayed, likening it almost to the posterior, that these two portions should be kept covered, unquote. Well, I mean, you know, for my part, I'd like to apologize for the variety of wind which my uncovered mouth utters, though I guess I could get some gum for the odor. Now, Catamosto continues, quote, There are no lords among them, save those who are richer. These are honored and obeyed to some degree by the others. They wear their, they wear their hair in locks down to their shoulders, almost in the German fashion, But their hair is black and anointed with fish oil, so that it smells strongly, which they consider a great refinement. The women of this country are light brown, and those of higher rank are wont to wear coarse cotton cloth, which comes from the land of the blacks, and some of the above-mentioned headgear. They do not wear shifts. They ride horses in the Moorish fashion, but do not have many. Since the country being sterile, they cannot support them, and also because of the great heat." So, Catamosto um, is an exceptionally valuable as, as a source to us. Uh, after leaving Arguem on his uh, voyage, he travels to the Senegal River. Uh, he states there that the people who lived at the Senegal were Jolof or Wolof people, and he immediately he noted the or he noticed, I should say, the importance of the river itself to the people of the region. The people of the Senegal, he says, had no ships, but instead made canoes from tree trunks, which were called almadi. In these, Catamasto tells us, quote, they constantly fish, ferry across the river, or paddle from place to place. These blacks are the most expert swimmers in the world, unquote. Catamasto also found the political system of the Jolof people fascinating. See, it was radically different than what he was used to in the monarchies of Europe. The Venetian tells us that Senegal was ruled by a young king, a young king excuse me, named Zucolin, though this kingdom, quote, does not descend by inheritance. In this land there are diverse lesser lords who, through jealousy, at times agree among themselves and set up a king of their own. This king rules as long as he is pleasing to the said lords. Thus his position is not stable and firm, but he is always in dread of deposition, unquote. Uh, And he's essentially talking about a republican form of government. Um, Now, Catamosto also thought the people of the region uh, were were poor. Uh, He says there were no city in the country, only villages with huts of straw. And also, because the size of the kingdom was only 200 miles long, it did not extend inland very far. He says the lords of the country presented the king each year with presents of horses, cows, goats, vegetables, millet, and the like, and from this the king supported himself by raids, which resulted in many slaves. He employed these slaves in cultivating the land, but also sold many to the Azanagwe merchants in return for horses and other goods, and also to Christians, since they had begun to trade with these blacks. The king and other chief men of the country were permitted to have as many wives as they wished and could support. Catamasto tells us specifically that Zucolan had 30 wives, in which, lived, which all lived in their own, basically, village or different area. Each had a house of her own with servants and slaves of her own. The king of Budomel, uh, which was a microstate south of the Senegal, only had nine wives himself, but each of these each had her own house with servants and slaves. And Each of these wives every day would prepare food for her husband, the king. Whether or not he showed up to eat it was another thing altogether. But according to Catamasto, African kings traveled between the homes of their wives, 
each day, quote, picks out whatever tempts him, unquote. Sounds like a pretty swell life to me, I guess. Must be good to be the king. Um, now, according to Catamasto, the people of the Senegal, though, were largely not Muslim, unlike Arguin, except for the traders, rulers, and other elites. He said that they were otherwise not very resolute in their faith in comparison to other Moors that he had encountered. However, he also notes that Arab or Azanagwe holy men resided in the country, and they gave some instruction in the laws of Muhammad. Um, now, Catamasto also had strong opinions on the fashion sense of the Jolofs. He reported that on the Senegal, the people, quote, almost all constantly go naked, except for a goatskin fashioned in the form of drawers with which they hide their shame. But the chiefs and those of standing wear a cotton garment, for cotton grows in these lands. Their women spin it into a cloth of a span of, of a span in width. These garments are made to reach halfway down the thigh, with wide sleeves to the elbow. They also wear breeches of this cotton, which are tied across and reach to the ankles, and are otherwise so large that when they are girded round the waist, they are much crumpled and form a sack in front, and their hinder part reaches the ground and waggles like a tail, the most comical thing to be seen in the world. Men and women always go barefoot. Now, Catamasto was somewhat more impressed with African hair, and said they wore nothing on their heads, that the hair of both sexes, though, is fashioned into neat tresses arranged in various styles, though the hair by nature is no longer than a span. And also, he clues us in to the nature of warfare. Catamasto believed that because of the great heat, the Senegal region had few horses, and also that the soldiers did not wear armor except for round, broad shields made of animal skin. For attacking, he said, they carried numerous spears, which they hurled very swiftly, for they are great masters at throwing them. These darts, he tells us, have a tip of iron wrought with barbs made in various styles, so that when they strike it lacerates the flesh to withdraw them. They also carry some Moorish weapons in the style of a short scimitar, and also another weapon, a kind of lance, because of all this, the combats are very fatal, which made them, in the Venetians' opinion, very courageous and brutal warriors. Now, later, Catamasto visited the small state of Budomel, which I think I told you is 80 miles south of the Senegal River. And here he discovers why horses were so rare uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Noting, quote, horses were highly prized and could not live long, growing fat and dying from a malady in which they are unable to make water and burst, unquote. Here he refers to sleeping sickness, though neither he nor the Africans fully understood how or why this happened, which is a disease carried by the tsetse fly. Um, now, Africans did try to keep their horses safe. In Budomel, um, a horse with its trappings... Uh, sold from 9 to 14 Negro slaves, according to the condition and breeding of the horse. Catamasto tells us that when the horse was, was brought, um, the African would send for horse charmers, who, quote, made a great fire of certain herbs, lighted after their fashion, which, and which makes a great smoke. Into this they lead the horse by the bridle, muttering their spells. Then they have it rubbed all over with an ointment, and keep it away for 15 to 20 days without anyone seeing it. Finally, they fastened it to its small charms, and they covered those charms with red leather to make them safer in battle, unquote. Now, these charms, by the way, are – that's still uh, something done in Africa today sometimes, and those uh, were would have been prayers or other texts from the Quran. Um, now, Katamasto made two voyages to Africa, and on his second, he made contact with the people of the Gambia River. Now here too, just like he did on the Senegal, Catamasto found people, quote, constantly journeying from place to place up and down the river in their canoes with women and men, as with us our boats do on the floods, unquote. Here on the Gambia, people navigated the river by means of oars, standing up with so many on each side of the canoe, always with one rower at the stern who rows now on one side, now on another, to keep the boat straight. 
They do not commonly venture far outside their own country, though, Catamosto tells us. Quote, for they are not safe from one district to the next from being taken and sold into slavery, unquote. Now, Catamosto's second voyage was cut short. A fever broke out amongst his crew, but he also had this to say um, at his time amongst the people of the Gambia River, of which there seems to have been two main ethnic groups, the Barbacene people and the Serer. Catamosto states that, quote, in their way of life, they conduct themselves in almost all respects similarly to the Negroes of the kingdom of Senega. They eat the same foods, except they have more varieties of rice that grow in the country. And also, they eat the flesh of dogs, which I have never heard of eaten anywhere else. Their garments are of cotton. The women are also clothed in a similar style. The women of the Senegal also commonly wore tattoos. Their flesh with the point of a needle, either on their breasts, arms, or necks. These appear like those designs of silk that are often made on handkerchiefs. They are made with fire, so they never disappear. Unquote. Katamasto also spoke of African religion. He noticed uh, a difference in faith amongst the various social classes. Quote, it is in general, he tells us, idolatry in various forms. Great credence is placed in spells and other diabolical methods with which they are acquainted. But all recognize one God, and some of them hold the tenets of Muhammad. The latter are men who frequent other countries, not remaining tied to their homes, for the peasantry know nothing of such things, unquote. And presumably, then, Islam was a more popular religion amongst African elites, I would say, than the general populace. Um, Katamasa also tells us that there were a large number of elephants in the country. He saw three wild ones himself, and he describes the hunting of the giant animals. And here you can really see how excellent Katamasto is with, this, with, with description. And, and, I, and this is why we're going to have to talk about him more next episode as well. But, okay, quote, They go hunting on foot, carrying no other weapon for the attack save the assegai and bows, all their weapons being poisoned. They seek the elephants in woods, for these prefer swampy places, where for the most part they resort like swine. The Negroes place themselves behind the trees, and wound the elephant with arrows or poisoned spears. They advance, scrambling and jumping from tree to tree, so that before the elephant, which is an unwieldy animal, can escape, it is wounded in many places without being able to defend itself. In the open, with no trees near, no man would dare to face one. For no man can run so fast that the elephant, without breaking its ordinary pace, could not overtake him, considering his size, for his size he is very rapid. If it happens by a mischance that an elephant pursues a man in the open and overtakes him, he attacks him with nothing but his great trunk, which is somewhat like that of a pig, except that a pig's snout is not mobile, as is the elephant's. It resembles a large, tough lip, which, unlike the pig, he is able to twist, extend, and shorten at will. Winding this trunk around the man, he hurls him so far into the air that often he is dead before he falls to the ground. This was told to me by many Negroes. But the elephant is not, however, so ferocious an animal that it will attack men without first being annoyed. Unquote. Now, I'll be honest. I am not 100% sure I even really needed to include that with this episode, but I like elephants, and frankly, the idea of elephants killing people is pretty funny to me. Now, one chief gave Catamasto some elephant to taste, speaking of them, which he roasted and boiled and did not enjoy, though he also mentioned that some of it was salted down and which made a fine gift for Henrique, the first he'd received from that part of the world. So, okay. So I think we better turn here um, to take a closer look at the political and economic history of Africa. The Atlantic world as an economic system from which flowed human commerce was created, funded by, and operated as an oceanic highway that transported many things across continents. 
But primi- primarily, it enslaved, it, the cargo was enslaved humans. So in beginning our conversation of Africa and of the people with whom are comprised within the, the I guess, the African Atlantic, I mean, in studying them, we're consumed, I think, I am at any rate, with just one question. It regards the institution of chattel slavery. The question is why? We know, I've made clear in our previous episodes, that that Europeans went charging down the African coastlines, seeking slaves for capture and sale, is clear. We know that much from the sources themselves. Uh, Zarara and Katamasto both make references to this regularly. We'll be returning to them in, in greater detail soon enough. But, and because of this, it was easy uh, to, I guess, cast blame on the conquistadors alone for the creation of the Atlantic slave trade. It's an institution which, over the coming four centuries, we'll see the forced diaspora of something like 14 million Africans into the New World. And I don't think we would be wrong in arguing that Europeans were responsible for that, especially considering that Portuguese conquistadors were making it a habit of sailing down the Atlantic coastline, kidnapping and stealing everything they could from the people of the coastal Sahara. Because of this, it's, I think, easy to imagine that the slave trade was forced upon African people by Europeans who brought horses and guns to Africa and with this military superiority forced African peoples into unfair economic relationships. Or or maybe instead, um, as as another uh, history might tell us, that it wasn't really European military superiority per se, but really backwardness of the Africans themselves with their lower level of economic development. And they were just unable to resist trading for European manufactured goods like cloth or iron, and even if that meant obtaining them through the sale of slaves. See, historians have posited both of these as possible reasons for the existence of the African slave trade, But to me, both of these explanations seem to reduce the agency of Africans to that of passive players in a game that Europeans are playing by themselves. And that just ain't how life works, in my experience. See, and instead, I, I don't even think our sources, uh, Zarara and Katamasto, I don't think they really portray sub-Saharan Africa in the 15th century as dominated by Europeans at all. See, the Portuguese conquistadors, once they manage to navigate south of the Sahara and they discover larger populations of Africans on the Senegal and, and, and farther south, they find these people are armed with poison arrows and with navies and could easily compete with the cannons and caravels of the Portuguese. And as a result, we're going to see that the Portuguese quickly abandon attempts at raiding in sub-Saharan Africa in favor of trade. And in doing so, they meet numerous African rulers and merchants who are both willing and capable of selling large number of slaves. So knowing this, we... We have to conclude that Europeans neither introduced chattel slavery into Africa, nor did they force Africans to sell them slaves through military means. So in, so in discussing Africa, and we have to return, I guess, to our original question. Why? Why would African rulers and other elites allow this to occur? Now, To begin to answer this question, we're going to have to begin with geography. Now, first off, Africa is gigantic. Now, maps can be deceiving because at 11.73 million square miles, 
Africa is the second largest landmass on Earth, second only to Asia. In fact, the United States could easily fit inside just the Sahara Desert. Sub-Saharan Africa is so large that it is roughly the size of China and Japan combined. In addition to those three countries, inside of Africa we could also fit India, Italy, Switzerland, the Netherlands and Belgium, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, and most of Eastern Europe. Oh, and um, that would still leave us off with Madagascar, which we could fill with uh, most of the UK. Now, so just for starters, we are talking about a massive place. So, Now, East Africa, for example, is completely different. You see, the Nile stretches south from the Mediterranean and has connected people there with others living all the way at the headwaters of that river system since antiquity. Now, the peoples of West Africa, though, are separated from the Mediterranean world by the Sahara, the largest desert in the world. Now, East Africans, as history progressed, became connected via oceanic trade routes to India and Asia, In West Africa, in contrast, the winds and currents of the Atlantic prevented oceanic travel. Um, Now, the Great Desert stretches to the ocean only in the west. In the north, it is stopped by the coastal plains of the Mediterranean. To the east, by the Nile River. And in the south, by the African savannas of the Sudan. Now, of these three agricultural zones. The Sudan is the least productive in terms of agricultural output. Wheat, olives, and most fruits will not grow in the Sudanic grasslands. And so the populations there instead based agricultural systems on millet and sorghum. Now these are hardy cereal crops, but they're not able to be exported very far. And so this left the people of the, of the Sudan with the impetus to embark on journeys across the Sahara in order to establish trade routes. Ralph Austin is the author of Trans-Saharan Africa in World History, and he tells us, The Sahara is a paradoxical place. Only a quarter of the desert is actually covered in sand. Most of the remaining terrain is almost as dry and consists of gravel, rocky plateaus, and plains. Hidden inside of this landscape, however, are scattered oases with permanent water and palm trees, as well as mountains and other large outcroppings that sometimes capture enough moisture to support vegetation. Now, south of there, Both Christian and Muslim writers considered the separate river systems of West Africa to be a single river, a Nile of the Sudan, or the Rio de Oro. And while these designations were misperceptions, they do reveal the extent of the riverine-based commercial routes that existed in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, What made the people of the Sudanic region of West Africa so successful as traders once they became knowledgeable about how to traverse the Sahara was that the western Sudan is dominated by three river systems, the Gambia, the Senegal, and most importantly, the Niger. While these three riverine systems are separate, they are close enough that short portages can connect them. John Thornton says in Africa and Africans and the Making of the Atlantic World, an excellent book, by the way, if I haven't already said so, that, quote, while the West African rivers contain enough falls and shoals that large oceanic vessels, such as caravels, could not travel too far down them, smaller riverine craft used by African peoples did not nearly have as much trouble navigating these waterways. The Niger River fully prov- further provided a corridor that ultimately added to this economic sphere the Hausa kingdoms, the Yoruba states, and the Nupe, Igala, and Benin kingdoms. When one considers the Benu River as an extension of this, then one truly gets an idea of how deeply the riverine system penetrated 
into West Africa. The first empire to control, to extend control, excuse me, over these routes was uh, the ancient and little known empire of Ghana. By the 13th century, though, the western Sudan was controlled by the much better documented empire of Mali. Now, much of what we know today of Mali is a result of a remarkable pilgrimage that happened uh, uh, by Mansa Musa, the emperor of Mali, who went to Mecca. He reached Cairo, Egypt in 1324. Ralph Austin tells us, quote, Cairo was an extremely sophisticated metropolis, and its citizens would not ordinarily have paid much attention to foreign travelers. However, Mansa Musa was so wealthy, and his country so little known to most Egyptians, that his expenditures of gold and his conversations with local notables were recorded in great detail, unquote. His pilgrimage, in fact, shows us that by the 14th century, the Sahara could be crossed in safety even by a king and a caravan carrying precious goods and accompanied by a large body of followers. And so that kind of also shows us the economic basis for trans-Saharan travel. Now, historians don't know precisely how much gold was taken across the Sahara, but the best estimates put it at just over one ton per year. This might sound like a small amount compared to modern standards, In the medieval world, African gold accounted for a full two-thirds of the world's money supply. It greased the worlds of commerce in the Mediterranean, the Middle East, India, and China. And it made Mali the wealthiest place on earth. Now, when the Portuguese began opening new markets on Africa's west coast, this begins to divert a lot of this traffic. And over time, over the next four centuries, from the 1500s to the 1900s, the Saharan trade routes become less important on the global stage. But it might surprise you to learn that while the importance of the Saharan trade became lessened as a a global trade route, the amount of traffic and the amount of commerce on the Sahara increased as a result of the Portuguese opening up new trade routes on the Atlantic, which, mind you, were cheaper for long-distance trade than land travel, is why they uh, were more successful over time. Now, the arrival of Europeans meant extra commerce on Africa's coast, and this expanded the economy of the entire region. And as a result, greater amounts of wealth accrued within Africa and stimulated additional trade in both the Atlantic and the Sahara routes. The Sahara routes crisscrossed across the Great Desert, in part to take advantage of oases, but mainly to take advantage of sources of other important goods to be found within the Sahara, dates, copper, and especially salt. Now, besides gold, the trade caravans carried a number of other luxuries north, but the most significant was slaves. Now, the Islamic world and Mediterranean Europe continued to import slaves beyond the year 1900. And in contrast, though, to the Atlantic slave trade, um, the number of Africans enslaved by the Saharan trade uh, is less well known. But the best estimates are that between the year 800 AD and 1900 AD, probably 10 million Africans were driven across the Sahara Desert. Now, and, and at a glance, this number actually seems pretty comparable to the 13 or 14 million Africans transported to the New World. But the Atlantic slave trade, most of that actually occurred over a much shorter period of time. Uh, between 1650 and 1850, uh, probably 10 million of those 14 million Africans were taken in those 200 years. And so it had a much greater impact on Africa. But on the other hand, 10 million is an awful lot of people. And it shows us that the market for enslavement existed in Africa before the arrival of the Portuguese. The Mali Empire, in fact, like most Sudanic governments, did not place heavy taxes on merchants dealing in gold, says Ralph Austin. Instead, local political authorities engaged with desert trade, mainly through the capture and export of slaves. Now, 
Further, the Sahara has been called a sea of sand. This comparison is quite apt, I think, when talking about the history of the Atlantic world. See, the caravans themselves actually served a similar purpose as the caravels of the Portuguese, because they were these are both vehicles for long-distance travel across otherwise inhospitable terrain. Now, in the case of the Portuguese, the key technological developments were nautical. And in the world of the Sahara, the most important technological develop, development excuse me, involved animal husbandry. The domestication of the camel allowed merchant caravans to operate in the Sahara with much greater efficiency, since in that environment, Camels can carry more and drink less water than other pack animals. The animals themselves were normally rented by urban merchants from Bedouin populations, who also acted as guides across the desert, which was a very lucrative position in the Middle Ages. Now, control of the various nodes of trade within the Saharan trade routes could mean incredible profits for those involved. Empires like Mali, Morocco, Tangiers, or nomadic peoples who had knowledge of the Saharan route, such as the Berbers or the Taregs, could profit tremendously from the enterprise. One Italian trader, Antonio Malafonte, ventured into the Saharan trade in the 15th century and was shocked to discover, quote, the people of Tuat refused to make transactions, buying or selling, without a 100% commission, unquote. Malafonte might have actually considered himself lucky to have even been allowed to trade for gold in the Saharan trade. Outsiders were discouraged from penetrating too deeply into this world. North African merchants, who did as Malafonte had attempted, were often told fantastic stories about the origins of the gold. Mansa Musa himself often spoke of a gold plant that blossomed after the rain and had leaves like grass and roots of gold. Now, you might think, as uh, the Atlantic and the Saharan trade routes begin, uh, both operate in the 1400s as the Atlantic uh, routes open up, that competition between these two trade routes would uh, increase. And competition for slaves uh, would maybe make them more uh, harder to get. But in a way, the two trade routes worked a little bit symbiotically because the demands of each market were very different. For slaves on the Atlantic slave trade, brutal plantation and mining work was basically their destiny. And that required a significant number of male slaves to fulfill the demand. But most slaves in the Islamic world, in contrast, ended up being employed by wealthy families as servants and concubines. So the Saharan trade route actually required a majority of female slaves. In fact, during the early modern era, even moderately prosperous urban families in the Muslim world often had enslaved servants. Men enslaved and brought across the Sahara often found themselves impressed into military forces of Muslim rulers in Egypt, North Africa, even as far east as Iraq. In these circumstances, enslaved Africans in the Islamic world functioned very differently than how enslaved Africans functioned as part of the Christian-formed Atlantic world. Now, that is not to say that slaves weren't ever treated harshly. A substantial minority of the captives did work within the desert in the gardens and wells of oases, in salt mines, and as local caravan crews. Others landed in gold mines. But since most slaves of the Saharan trade ended up as household servants or in military service, they had, generally speaking, greater degrees of freedom within their new society than within the plantation complex of the Atlantic world that begins to develop uh, in the 1400s. Now, Islamic law actually required that masters recognized sons who had been fathered with enslaved African women, and both mother and child would be granted freedom in such a circumstance. Now, in the 17th century, one such man, Maule Ismail, even became the emperor of Morocco, and his power was based on a large black army. Ralph Austin tells us, quote, The most negative side effect to this relatively open-ended slavery system was the constant demand for servants to replace those who had become free, unquote. Now, this is not the only factor increasing demand for slaves in the Islamic world of the time, 
Death rates for slaves during the trans-Saharan forced migration were high, just as they were in the Atlantic. And once exposed to Mediterranean diets and diseases, many enslaved Africans died soon after arriving in their new environments. Now, so as we can see, the goods that Europeans sought on the coast um, were similar, but... uh, Excuse me. Now, while the goods that Europeans sought on the coast were basically the same that flowed across the Sahara, uh, essentially gold and slaves, Africa is um, large enough and the demands of the slave trades different enough that instead of diminishing each other in a state of pure competition, Africans involved in the trade suddenly benefited from the uh, availability of trade in the Sahara and on the Atlantic. And this stimulated greater commercial activity, bringing material gains to all those who profited from trade in Africa, basically. See, while Muslim societies preferred women slaves to form the majority of slave trading caravans, European plantations in the New World explicitly required two-thirds of the Africans brought to them be male. In addition, even by the, by the early 16th century, new foods from the Americas began to have an explosive impact on populations in the Old World, including Africa. Cassava or manioc, maize, peanuts, and a lot of other crops grew very well in Africa. And while we will be speaking in much greater detail about this um, uh, after we're done with our first series here and uh, we get into our next series, which is going to focus on pre-Columbian America, these new food sources are going to, in the future, allow African lands to support far greater numbers of people, and this is going to greatly lessen the demographic if impact of forced emigration across two frontiers at the same time. Now, over time, Europeans enjoy, will enjoy advantages over North African merchants in having trading locations closer to the gold mines and in the greater efficiency of ships compared to camels. But obtaining a majority of the trade in Africa would take time. Now, Zarara and Katamasto will be quite illuminating here when we uh, begin diving further into the accounts, or especially Katamasto, Zarara, not so much. But it took some time for the Europeans to begin to understand the desires of African consumers and to better tap into the African trade routes with the types of cloth and iron goods uh, that were desired in Africa. So as a result, uh, the trans-Saharan trade routes are kind of eclipsed in the 16th century as a major factor on the global economy, um, while simultaneously those same routes will also become bigger. And more important, um, and, and they will also be more important to Africa's local economy, Uh, since the African Atlantic will increase the overall size of Africa's economy despite the export of slaves. Now, seeing as how we do have uh, this trade route that is already existing before the Atlantic world happens, um, that kind of puts us in an interesting, uh, gives me an interesting thought, which is, you know, it's often been argued that Europeans, uh, I guess, discovered the Americas when Columbus and other navigators first reached the New World. And by this logic, I think there's some irony in the fact that Africans discovered Europe. Europeans didn't reach sub-Saharan Africa until the 15th century, but Africans were found throughout the Mediterranean world vis-a-vis the slave trade um, through the Saharan trade routes since antiquity. This is the essential argument in David Northrop's book, Africa's discovery of Europe. Now, the kingdom of Ethiopia, excuse me, he tells us, actually sent a delegation to Rome to try and foster an alliance against Islam way back in 1328. And in 1402, Ethiopian ambassadors presented the Doge of Venice with gifts of leopards and spices. In 1428, Ethiopian influence in the Mediterranean was felt again when the emperor proposed a double marriage of alliance with the king of Aragon. Now, this remained uncompleted, but his successor, the famous emperor Zerazacob, dispatched another delegation in 1450 to Alfonso, king of Aragon and Naples, 
One of the main objects of this mission was to bring back European miniaturists for manuscript illumination, gold and silversmiths, trumpeters, and arms makers of all sorts. And in 1452, Ethiopian ambassadors arrived at Lisbon. In 1459, another ambassador traveled to Milan, and the duke of that city-state wrote to the Ethiopian emperor to inquire whether the Ethiopians possessed the magic books written by his ancestor Solomon, a, a likely reference to the Kebra Nagast, or the Ethiopian Book of the Glory of Kings. Now, the reason the Ethiopians are sending so many delegations north to Europe just a few years before the Portuguese are able to send ships so far out, mind you, was that during this time the Ottoman Turks were assaulting the Byzantine Empire. By 1453, remember, they will have conquered Constantinople, and the Ethiopians were eager to obtain aid to meet the Muslim threat presented by the growing power of the Turks. Now, of course, Royal delegations were not the only Africans in Europe during the Middle Ages. Black slaves are described in the Mediterranean in the 13th and 14th centuries. And while white slaves were much more common than those identified as black or olive in Christian records, um, they were still numerous enough to be recorded as existing in Mediterranean Europe hundreds of years earlier than Europeans were living in sub-Saharan Africa. Thus, some smaller number of African slave traders must have also visited Mediterranean Europe as well during the Middle Ages, if not earlier. Now, so consequently, Europeans became accustomed to seeing dark-skinned Africans, and they were not surprised when they encountered them below the Sahara. Uh, once the Portuguese expeditions begin in the mid-15th century, but since Europeans had not previously gone so far south, the appearance of them uh, of uh, the would-be conquistadors of Africa in places like the Senegal River, Benin, and the Congo. This was pretty startling to Africans. And the more farther south the Portuguese sailed, as they reached more isolated parts of this gigantic continent whose inhabitants had not experienced direct contact with foreigners from the Sahara or the Indian Ocean, let alone from Europe, the, the, farther, the less likely the Portuguese were to encounter people who would have even suspected that non-black people even existed. Now, this is also, we should remember, a time and a place in the world where, or well, all the places in the world, where most people ascribed supernatural origins to every aspect of life. So David Northrop tells us that the Africans considered Europeans to have magical properties. See, the, European, the Portuguese' strange appearance in comparison to normal humans, as well as their unfamiliar material possessions, in fact, led Africans to believe the Europeans to be wizards and in league with evil spirits. Now, Northrop continues that before long, Africans thus came to two profound but somewhat contradictory conclusions. One was that these creatures so different in appearance from normal humans, might be dangerous sorcerers or evil spirits whose marvelous possessions came through the use of evil magic. Since such powers could only be obtained through horrific rites and malevolent actions that went against normal ethical values, such as murder and cannibalism, these wizards ought to be avoided. But... A second African conclusion went in the opposite direction. It would be good to befriend these visitors from across the ocean in order to acquire some of their marvelous goods and gain access to whatever spiritual power or practical knowledge lay behind them. So, all right. Um, I think so far I've done a pretty halfway decent job of explaining that markets and long-distance trade existed within Africa, that these connected regions over vast distances, um, that they were largely operated by Saharan populations um, and Sudanic populations who understood the terrain and who maintained camels and thus were able to operate within the Sahara in a similar fashion to how northern populations from Europe were using the Mediterranean and other waterways to transport luxury goods including precious metals and slaves. Now, powerful empires,
such as the Mali, rise in the Sudan, just as powerful empires rise in North Africa, in order to obtain control over this trade. But as the Portuguese continued going farther south, they were encountering African populations who were not directly a part of the Saharan trade, meeting people who traded with the Sudan, and excuse me, and from whence their luxury goods might be transported across the Sahara, but whom also lived far enough from the Sudan that they were not often subjected to slave raids from people like the Mali, if at all. The Portuguese who visited here found Africans who were both able to defend themselves from forced enslavement by the Portuguese, but who also were willing and capable of selling slaves. So by understanding the trans-Saharan slave, uh, the, the, the trans-Saharan trade and the trans-Saharan tra slave routes, that helps us understand African slavery. But the trans-Saharan trade doesn't alone fully explain the prevalence of slave markets in Africa. And in meeting these people too far distant to be directly involved in the trans-Saharan trade, remember, Africa is a gigantic place, we are again confronted with the question of why. Why did African rulers and other elites allow millions of Africans to be removed across the Atlantic? Now, to answer that question, we will rely on John Thornton and the research he compiled to create Africa and Africans and the making of the Atlantic world from 1400 to 1800, and because answering that question is one of the primary focuses of his book. Now, the first of the possible answers to these questions Thornton considers is the most obvious, I think, that European domination of the high seas gave them distinct political and economic advantages over Africans, and later Americans and Asians for that matter, um, according to this thesis. Now, Thornton though makes clear that this is not very convincing. Zarara and Catamasto both make clear that unlike the Guanche people of the Canary Islands, who possessed no boats at all, the peoples of West Africa had a well-developed, specialized maritime culture that was fully capable of protecting its own waters. Now, when the Portuguese first arrived along the Senegal River in 1444, Lancerat de Lagos was able to seize residents with brutal fashion. Subsequent expeditions would attempt the same, but West Africans were now alerted to the possible danger. In 1446, Nuno Tristo attempted to land an armed force in the Senegambian region and was attacked by African vessels, and the Africans succeeded in killing nearly all of the raiders. The next year, in 1447, a Danish sailor in Henrique's service named Valarte was killed, along with most of his crew, when they were attacked by African vessels near the island of Goree. Now, the specialized watercraft used by West Africans presented a small, fast, and difficult targets for European weapons and they couldn't carried substantial firepower as well in their archers and javelinmen. From Angola up to the Senegal, African military and commercial craft tended to be built uh, and designed specifically for the navigational problems of the West African coast and the associated river systems. So generally, they were carved from single logs of tropical trees and only occasionally had their sides built up. They tended to be long, very low in the water, consequently, powered by oars instead of sails, and were maneuverable, completely independent, thus, of wind or current. Since they drew little water, they could be operated on the coast and along rivers, as well as inland estuaries, lagoons, and creeks. While a fisherman's craft might be small and designed for between two and five men, the larger craft, designed to carry soldiers, might carry upwards of 50 or even 100 because they were fast and low in the water, they posed a difficult target for the weapons, like I said, and this combined with the considerable danger of the poisoned arrows and darts used by the West Africans meant that once the Portuguese caravels got close to the shore, the conquistadors lost any naval advantages which they might have had at sea, and sometimes were actually operating at a disadvantage. Now, this is not to say that Africans were able to 
obtain a decisive naval advantage themselves, um, African watercraft were not designed to go very far out to sea, and the larger, high-sided Portuguese vessels were difficult for them to storm. Alvis Catamasto recorded an encounter with an African flotilla in the Gambia in 1456, uh, where Catamasto and his ship had been mistaken for another raiding party from Portugal, who was also in the area, and they were immediately attacked by 17 large craft, carrying 150 men with the two forces uh, quickly drawn into a standstill. So, in most cases, the Africans were unable to take European ships by storm, um, and also, though, in most cases, the Europeans likewise were unable to achieve success with seaborne attacks on mainland Africa. Now, as a result, according to John Thornton, the Europeans had to abandon their time-honored tradition of trading and raiding, and instead engage with the Africans with peaceful, regulated trade. Now, so... Thornton thus concludes, and I agree, that, quote, not only did African naval power make raiding difficult, it also allowed Africans to conduct trade with the Europeans on their own terms, collecting customs and other duties as they liked, unquote. So we can see that European rulers and the more powerful European subjects of these rulers uh, were, by the mid-15th century, had realized tremendous profit or potential for profit, in the wealth that lay in Atlantic commerce. And they were in the process, basically, of obtaining economic control over this new economic world from the pioneers who had first created it. And while the powerful uh, elites in Europe achieved control over commerce of the high seas, in Africa they were unable to dominate either the coast or coastal navigation. Our sources make clear so that the, that the hypothesis that European conquistadors forced the slave trade upon Africans by means of naval domination really just frankly seems laughable. But international trade is not measured solely by naval power. And as John Thornton says, African naval victories might not necessarily guarantee that the commerce which grew up in the place of this raiding was truly under African control or serving African interests. In fact, numerous historians have posited the hypothesis that the commerce between Africans and Europeans was by its nature destructive and unequal for the Africans, and they were forced through commercial weakness into trade of slaves. Now, the most influential scholar to advocate this position was Walter Rodney, who um, Rodney saw Africa as forced into a sort of colonial trade in which Africans gave up raw materials and human resources in the form of slaves in exchange for manufactured goods because Africa was at a lower level of economic development than Europe. But as John Thornton says in uh, the research into African economic development at the start of the 16th century, uh, quote, does not support this pessimistic position, unquote. Now, in fact, we know from Ralph Austin's analysis of the trans-Saharan trade that in total, the African economy grew as new commercial nodes with Europeans opened up on the Atlantic coast, not just in West Africa, but also in the regions of Africa which contained the trans-Saharan routes. These also increased in trade. And Moreover, African manufacturing seems that it was more than capable of handing competition from pre-industrial Europe. And further, Europe really wasn't selling anything in Africa that was substantially different than the manufacturing goods that Africans were already producing themselves. See, the main goods Europe brought to Africa before the year 1650 were cloth, metal goods, currency, and what John Thornton terms non-utilitarian goods, things like jewelry and alcohol and other curiosities and luxuries, like eh, toys and little, you know, luxury, you know, rich people stuff. Now, I'll be honest with you. When I read that, it took me a little while to square away the idea of alcoholic beverages and jewelry being in the same category. 
Uh, one of those two items has special addictive qualities. Um, and when I read that, I wasn't sure whether alcohol was introduced to Africa by Europeans. But sub-Saharan Africans, after I did some research, uh, I, I learned were already producing a very popular type of alcohol in the form of palm wine. And in addition, sorghum was also distilled into an alcoholic beverage. So most, so like most of the other manufactured goods sold by Europeans to Africans, it appears to me that the alcohol sold was a luxury good and not something that with its special addictive properties was a newly introduced toxic or some toxic substance on African society. Um, no, I'm sure it was. It just wasn't newly introduced. And, and that would make the, so that makes basically the commerce on the African Atlantic very similar to the commerce that was happening anywhere else in the old world, except for that it was on caravels. Now, by the early 16th century, most important goods imported by Europeans to Africa, uh, you know, the most important good was cowrie shells. Uh, and these are small purple and white shells. Um, they're very durable, difficult to forge, and they're not, not manufactured at all. And neither were they immediately available because cowries, which is a, a shell produced by a mollusk or some other shellfish, come from the Maldive Islands off the coast of India, where they're quite plentiful. And it won't be until after the Portuguese round the Horn of Africa in the late 1400s and begin to connect themselves into the economic world of the Indian Ocean that they will become more widely available. Now, on the part of the Portuguese, the shells are very useful for oceanic navigation since heavy items such as cowrie shells made for excellent ballast for ships. Now, cowries were used as currency in West Africa and across the Trans-Saharan Trade Network and in some other parts of Central Africa. And so, obviously, this was a highly desired item in Africa. The Portuguese ability to import huge amounts of cowries made prices rise dramatically in the Trans-Saharan Trade as a result. And one would suppose similar increases in prices were also occurring on the West African coastal societies as a result of this. But Austin also notes that while prices quickly doubled in the early 16th century as a result of this uh, increased amount of currency, they afterwards remained level for the next 300 years. So... The increased prevalence of currency in Africa doesn't actually seem to have caused much inflation, a strong indicator of a healthy and rapidly growing economy. Now, looking at other items on the list of trade goods, we don't really find that any are essential commodities. And combined with the knowledge that Africa's economy was experienced tremendous growth during the early modern period, we can reasonably conclude, I believe, that John Thornton is correct when he says that Africans chose to trade with Europeans not to meet African needs that the trade developed or even to make up shortfalls in production or failures in quality of the African manufacturers. Rather, Africa's trade with Europe was largely moved by prestige, fancy, changing taste, and a desire for variety. See, Let's start with iron. See, the, the Portuguese didn't really import much iron into Africa. It actually wouldn't be until the 17th century when Dutch and English traders arrived on the scene when Europe began importing large amounts of iron to Africa. Now, in part, the Portuguese probably felt some obligation to honor the papal injunctions against selling materials with potential military value to infidels. But at the same time, in the 1400s, the Portuguese kings often requested exemptions against these same papal injunctions when it came to overseas trade. And so I think the more likely reason that the Portuguese weren't, ma weren't selling much iron in Africa is that they just weren't manufacturing enough of it to make much profit selling it. In Africa, it was, after all, an iron-producing part of the world, and the Senegambia region was well-supplied with quality iron from producers in Fouta Jalan, as well as poorer quality locally produced iron in the 15th century, which is when the Portuguese arrive on the scene. Now, 
By the early 16th century, the Portuguese were bringing some iron bars as well as finished iron goods to the Senegambia. However, at the same time, African iron workers had developed new ironworking techniques which saved fuel and allowed the production of amazingly high quality steel by devising a system that preheated the air blast which entered a furnace. And so African steel of the 15th century was equal to or maybe even better than the steel produced in early modern Europe. And now the Portuguese did quickly learn about how Africans preferred to use metal weapons. Uh, Zerara tells us this of African missiles, quote, the arrows are made so they have no feathers nor a notch for the string to enter, but are all smooth and short and made of rushes or reeds, and their iron points are long, and some are made of wood fixed in the shafts, which are like iron spindles with which the women of the country spin. And they use other little harpoons of iron, the darts of which are all poisoned, and their azagais are made with seven or eight harpoon-like prongs. Now, African steel required... Uh, considerable amounts of wood. And so for regions like the Senegambia, located some distance from centers of iron production on the northern edge of the rainforest, iron was expensive. Now, lower quality European iron was competitive in price and could be employed for uses which did not require exceptional quality, especially thrown javelins and spears during war. Um, and sometimes tools like shovels and hoes, which might be worn down over several years due to, you know, use and rocks in the ground. But to be honest, it's preferable for tools like shovels and hoes, hoes to last as long as possible. And so these items were often crafted out of local iron. Weaponry, on the other hand, and especially spears and javelins and arrowheads, you don't really need high-quality metal to be effective uh, for these single-use items anyway. Um, so most of the low-quality iron which Africans bought from Europeans was for weapons. Now, of course, African high-quality metal and small... Uh, they, they also did buy small amounts of high-quality metal from Europeans, but also this was sometimes in the form of... We or often in the form of weapons, such as a European sword which was found at a burial site at the medieval African site of Rao, which dates to the 12th or the 13th century. Now, that sword must have been purchased through the Trans-Saharan trade. And considering that Africans um, were capable both of the quality metal and skill to make swords, the value of item wasn't in that it was a sword. The value was that it was a sword from very far away. To own a sword from so far, in fact, was to show great wealth and prestige. Thornton concludes, um, and he adds a lot of specific statistics, which I'm, I'm not going to include right here for the purpose of keeping things interesting, uh, but we can see from Thornton's research that Europeans met somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of West Africa's iron needs. The rest was locally produced. The Euro iron, which Europeans sold to Africans, seems to have been almost entirely for African elites in the forms of arms for their soldiers and as well as ceremonial weaponry for themselves. Now, this same point can be shown even more clearly uh, with cloth. Now, iron is distributed unevenly around the surface of the globe. And additionally, the sources of lumber necessary to fuel forges mean that iron as a resource is predisposed to long-distance trade. Now, cloth, on the other hand, can be made almost anywhere. We can't say that Africans bought cloth from Europeans because they lacked it themselves. We can't say that European cloth was functionally better than African cloth either in the sense of providing protection from the elements. Finally, European cloth was not cheaper than its African counterpart either. In fact, we will see on the contrary, the, the Portuguese often praised African cloth, which was already widely traded in West Africa upon the arrival of Europeans. But nevertheless, West Africans imported tremendous amounts of cloth from the Portuguese. So too, though, did they export cloth. In fact, the level of exports from eastern Congo was on par with the great Dutch textile manufacturing centers of the same time such as Leiden. Both places, the annual production in the 16th century ran right about 
100,000 meters of cloth per year. Now, the reason why both Africa and Europe imported tremendous amounts of cloth while simultaneously exporting tremendous amounts of cloth was that the consumption of cloth, even more so than owning a, fair, fo- a fancy foreign sword, man, that's a great way of demonstrating prestige. The principal use of cloth is as much bodily decoration as protection from the elements, John Thornton tells us. And in this context, it's really easy to see why Africans demanded a wide variety of beads and other trinkets for jewelry. That Africans paid high prices for European beads and other trinkets wasn't really a sign that the African economy was deficient, and therefore Europeans were able to impress high prices on the Africans. Africans valued these items specifically for their prestige and foreignness, and, and maybe even they bought these items not in spite of high prices, but because of the outrageous prices. After all, what use is giving your wife a new necklace if everyone can buy one? Now, viewing all of this, we can see that European trade with Africa can't really be seen as a a disruptive, destructive force in itself. It doesn't oust lines of African production It doesn't thwart development by providing items through trade that have otherwise that would have otherwise maybe been manufacturing manufactured from within Africa. And as a result, there really wasn't any reason for Africans to have wanted to stop the trade. And I don't think their desire for trade with Europeans was based on necessity at all. Africa traded with Europe because of the based on the whims and the desires of African elites. And they manufactured and exported considerable quantities of manufactured goods to Europe. So, with that said, we can see that Europe neither pillaged Africa as a bunch of raiding conquistadors, nor indirectly as traders from a more advanced economy. But I think we should take a look at one other way Europeans might have exercised control, and and, and that's via organizational advantages. Maybe Europeans um, had a greater orientation towards profit than Africans, or with superior commercial organization. Uh, Maybe this gave them an ability to restrict imports to Africa in such a way as to exercise partial monopolies. Now, any of these factors, or some combination of them, could have given the Portuguese commercial advantages that could easily translate into an ability to force Africans into one-sided agreements. Now, the main problem with this thesis is that, as a, mean, as a means of understanding how trade in, in, of Europe and Africa operated, is that well, the governments in both Europe and Africa in the 1400s, and, and for quite some time after this, mind you, regarded long-distance trade as falling under their jurisdiction. Quoting Thornton, quote, to be ruled and controlled by them and ultimately to serve their needs ahead of the buyers and sellers, unquote. So rulers in Africa and Europe attempted to control trade between the two continents as best as they could. Um, they both attempted to distort more markets in their favor. And this is an economic viewpoint which, which we call mercantilism. And, and under it, it's all well and good for private merchants to make profits engaging in long distance trade. But the main concern of the state was to enhance its own revenue ahead of other economic concerns, such as increasing the volume of trade. And so Europeans attempted two basic strategies in this regard. First, uh, with salaried or commissioned agents who were tasked with obtaining revenue from merchants who lived on the proceeds of long-distance commerce. And whenever possible, they would give these merchants monopolies with the idea that the increased profits from a single visible source would lead to enhanced tax revenues. Now, in addition, the European state's role was sometimes also vested in various chartered companies. 
uh, starting, of course, with uh, the Portuguese monopolies given to Henrique, for example. Now, these two types of trade strategies a lot of times coexisted as various European rulers tried to find the perfect formula for maximizing revenues while minimizing the effort and cost involved in making these revenues. And, and as a result, European merchants intending to trade on the West African coast had to go rather complex negotiations before leaving Europe and actually exchanging commodities in Africa. Now, in a similar way, African rulers and other elites similarly worked to control trade with Europeans. Catamasto, for example, the Venetian trader, first had to negotiate with Henrique and the Portuguese state in order to obtain a license to sail to Guinea. Upon his arrival, he, and when he met the African ruler Budamel, for example, he went and underwent another series of negotiations, giving gifts to the head of the state. He had to stay, uh, made an extended stay with a nobleman, and, and eventually was able to trade with the merchants of the area. Now before, or excuse me, besides the attempted control by Europeans and African rulers, which was uh, designed to make sure they got larger slices of the proverbial pie, um, now they also, European rulers also were attempting to create monopolies, as I said, in order that they might obtain better prices by maintaining control over the supply of European goods to Africa. But two factors worked against this on the European side, not to mention African hostility towards paying higher prices. Now, first, other European states were quite cognizant of the rewards involved in overseas trade. And right off the bat, Portugal and Castile undermine each other's attempts to obtain monopolies in Europe. By the mid-16th century, they will be joined by interlopers from all over Europe. And this competition severely undercuts prices. Second, state officials and private traders without license were constantly going into business with each other undercutting state control. The Portuguese attempted to get around the first problem by obtaining papal support for a Portuguese monopoly in, in Africa. The Portuguese crown even received this papal support. But unfortunately for them, the Pope was just about the only person in Europe except for the Portuguese king who was really interested in accepting Portuguese sovereignty of the uh, African Atlantic. Now, the Portuguese and the Spanish, for their part, didn't even begin to respect each other's supposed monopolies on sea lanes until 1479. And the agreement made then only stopped official Castilian voyages from going to Africa and official Portuguese voyages from going to the Canaries. The Castilians did not at all stop their private sailings to Africa after this, and they very much so continued to collect tax on the revenues generated from this trade. Now, in that same year, 1479, Eustace de la Fosse to undertook a voyage from Flanders to the Gold Coast. The English became involved soon afterwards. The French were regularly sailing into the African Atlantic as well by the early 16th century. The main problem with stopping all of this was that the cost to do so would have been astronomical and would have involved probably far greater naval and economic output capabilities than any single European state was capable of at the time. Thus, the fact that both private citizens and government officials, who typically themselves were rich merchants who had purchased their positions, that um, they just all kept participating in the trade, and that undermined the effectiveness of, of monopoly. Um, now, further, no small number of private traders or low-ranking Portuguese officials chafed under the regulation um, of this system. A lot of these people realized that their place in the Portuguese system of rewards under controlled trade would remain low, and permanently so. And so, they defected to the Africans. Um, in many situations, African rulers were quite willing to permit uh, private concessions of their own that allowed these smaller-time traders to profit from trade instead of simply being agents. And in fact, by the 1520s, there were enough of these unofficial settlers that this group of Euro-Africans became a distinct kind of social class of their own. They were called Lancados, and they became fairly widely distributed throughout Africa. Many Lancados had connections to other traders from places like the Cape Verde Islands, 
And many were new Christians, that is, Portuguese Jewish conversos, who, because of that, their chances for advancement in, Jew in Portuguese service was quite limited. Now, to counter this, the Portuguese state attempted to group all the Portuguese in Africa in supervised settlements under control of royally appointed factors. These factories, or feitorias, surely helped control corruption somewhat, but as a whole, the system failed to control those Portuguese who just simply continued to make their own arrangements with African authorities. Further, while the Portuguese attempted throughout the 16th century to keep other Af Europeans out of Africa, they failed, uh, even when on the Gold Coast, where the Portuguese position was the strongest, and that was in part due to the impossibility of maintaining the tremendous amount of sea power necessary to keep out enemy ships, but also because they were frankly unable, completely unable, to keep Africans, who were not at all under Portuguese rule, from refraining from trade with other Europeans. And so, despite Portuguese attempts to centralize and monopolize trade, Africans preserved their sovereignty, and the Portuguese crown and other Europeans did not succeed in dominating the African trade. And Now, stepping back from this a bit, because it, it's clear from this evidence that European merchants, uh, they're just not able to monopolize trade in Africa at all, but I should also be clear that, Europe, that African states were trying to do the very same thing, and they were also unable to do so, not from the lack of trying. African states put up, in fact, great number of legal and technical obstacles between European merchants and African buyers, as well as most states themselves being active participants in the trade. So in 1655, uh, such that in 1655, a Dutch merchant even printed a commercial guide to his slave coast of Africa. There, at Alada, for example, prospective European buyers of slaves and cloth had to present a complex series of presents to dancers, food sellers, linguists, brokers, Alada nobles, and the king himself, both upon arrival and upon departure. The system was not unique, and the Dutch guidebook describes similar experiences at Benin, Calabar, the Niger Delta, and the Gabon region, all involved gifts to rulers or counselors, with the amount varying by status or position. Now, on the Gold Coast, where a Portuguese feitoria existed uh, since 1482, the lengthy personal visits of the traders were regularly were replaced, excuse me, by regular presents given by the Portuguese state to all the local officials. Many Europeans complained about these time-consuming negotiations, which were essentially a manifestation on the insistence of the part of African authorities that they benefit first from any trade with Europeans, and they sometimes even gave gifts back to the Europeans a way of making basically special connection between the two parties, which would help ensure that they might receive first choice of the best goods and prices in the future. In addition, most African rulers insisted on getting their own special price for their goods and for the goods they purchased. Finally, uh, African rulers could start and stop trade at will. As we see in the example of Benin, the king of Benin shut down the male slave market in the early 1500s, and eventually decided to eliminate trading in slaves altogether. The king of Congo likewise instituted strict regulations on commerce, and at times even prevented it altogether. Still, much more often, African rulers were normally content to allow trade to take place once they'd received their fair share. Though this did not mean that trade in Africa was any sort of real free market. And that's because although African states allowed private trade, they just as Europeans did, they played a major part in determining which Africans might trade. The African bourgeoisie, like their counterparts in, Afri in Europe, thrived in no small part due to the state support they received. In the Senegambia region, for example, most African julas, a Mandinka term for merchant, were marabouts, which is a term for a traveling Muslim scholar. And this class of merchants possessed their own towns in a great network that stretched deep into the country by which they were in touch with the commercial life of the interior. The marabouts were also important counselors of the African rulers of the Senegambia. And one of the privileges they got as a result of this 
um, seems to have been that the right to control trade or at least negotiations between the state and visiting traders. Thus, African rulers found it was better to leave commercial risk in private hands and charge a steady and sure tax, just as their European states were doing. Now, in sum, what this means is that African and European states both attempted to exercise close control over trade via their legal systems. And this caused a lot of market interference. Now, while this might seem unproductive in terms of having a free market um, being a bit overly regulated, shall we say, remember, Africa is a big place. And in the, there were parts of it where there was an absence of powerful African state control. And like, for example, the southern part of Sierra Leone or along the Gabon coast, or what was variously called the Grain Coast, the Maguleta Coast, or the Ivory Coast. There, Europeans often paid no taxes and engaged in no special negotiations in order to trade. This, in fact, is how John Thornton characterizes the trade in these places. Quote, Here, Africans sailed small canoes in groups of two or three for small-scale, impromptu bargaining over ivory, pepper, foodstuffs, and occasionally gold. But the commerce was always risky, and without the protection of the state, Africans were sometimes carried away by Europeans as slaves, or African traders would jump ship with European commodities in their possession before payment had been completed. So in these parts of Africa, trading was always conducted with great caution and much bad faith on both sides, and perhaps, in the end, without much profit." Unquote. Now, Private merchants in Africa themselves sometimes thwarted attempts by African states to monitor and control access of the markets, just as private merchants in Europe attempted to do so. The Julas involved in the Gold Coast trade did not hesitate in sending products to Senegambian or North African markets if the quantity and quality of trade goods they desired was not to be found on the Gold Coast a market circumstance which at least one Portuguese factor called in a report, quote, the Mandinga leak, unquote. So looking at all of this, we can see, as John Thornton does, that the Atlantic states, both European and African, sought to, quote, enhance their revenues by marginally distorting the market, unquote. But the presence of these private traders and the political and military rivalries of African and European states greatly reduced the potential impact of state control of the trade. Now, neither Africans or Europeans were thus able to achieve monopolies that would change the overall terms of trade between the two continents. Trade therefore remained competitive, probably favoring no particular national or, regi act, re national or regi regional actors of, at all and certainly not Europeans at the expense of Africans. So I think we can say with some confidence that Africa's commercial relationship with Europe therefore worked the same as international trade anywhere else in the world. And that means that Europeans weren't forcing the slave trade on Africans. Now, on the contrary, Africans were experienced traders who controlled the Atlantic trade up to the point that slaves and other cargo were loaded onto European ships. Europeans didn't force the slave trade upon unwilling African participated. Instead, they tapped an existing market. In response, Africans increased demand over the centuries and provided more slaves. And so again, I think we are confronted with an issue and a question. Why? Why is the sale of slaves allowed by African rulers? If we look at the slave trade, we can see that it was demographically damaging from an early period, especially on local or regional le le levels. But we know that Africa is a very, very big place. Simply put, the decision makers who allowed the slave trade to continue, whether merchants or political leaders, did not personally suffer the larger scale losses and were able to maintain their operations. Slavery was widespread in Africa, and the growth and development of the institution within Africa were independent of the Atlantic trade. In, in fact, the opposite, I think, happened. 
the Atlantic slave trade was an outgrowth of internal African slavery. Africa was not, as we have seen, an economically underdeveloped region. It wasn't forced to sell slaves because it had no cargo. Otherwise, Henry the Navigator would not have been interested in the place, plain and simple. The slave trade wasn't an impact, therefore, brought in from the outside forces. But it grew out of and was rationalized within African law and African political and economic structures. Because in Africa, in contrast to Europe, where land was the primary form of private revenue-producing property, and slavery was more of a minor investment of wealth, um, power in African societies was based on ownership of people, and land was owned corporately by societies. Slaves were, in fact, the only form of private revenue-producing property recognized in African law. Um, okay, so, and I say this, in, in Europe and in Asia, um, land ownership was basically a precondition for making productive use of slaves. Now, land ownership in itself is basically legal fiction. Owning land is literally owning dirt. What owning a land, piece of land, really means is that the owner may claim the product of anything produced on the land or could charge rent for the use of that land. Now, excuse me. Now, land wasn't for sale in Africa. Land wasn't available as private property. And because of that, slavery within Africa historically and possibly in the prehistory was in many ways the equivalent of the landlord-tenant relationship in Europe and maybe even as widespread. The African social system wasn't backward in comparison to the social system of Europe. It was really just kind of legally divergent. African rulers and other elites established legal claims over other human beings via slavery and taxation of slaves. And one very important result of this social system is that African political and economic elites could sell large numbers of human beings to whomever would pay. And this is what fueled the Atlantic slave trade as much as European desire for slaves. So with that said, let's stop for a moment, and we're going to briefly talk about a few misperceptions. First, some of our own, perhaps. Now, depending on what you may believe... Uh, and after all, uh, a lot of people have argued this. Um, you might think that societies without private property as a form uh, in the form of land are less exploitative or less unequal than societies like European societies, which do have private land ownership. Um, I, the evidence just doesn't support that view. That's just... Um, Societies without land ownership can be less exploitative, but the argument that they are by nature less exploitative counts on as evidence to back up this claim that these societies didn't have enough population density to support the competition required to create private land ownership, as is what happened in Europe. But to be honest, most, most of sub-Saharan West Africa contained an average population density of well over 30 persons per square kilometer. And that was well over the average European density at the time. Beyond that, there's something even more blatant. African societies did not have private land ownership, but they absolutely did possess inequalities and exploitation in ample amounts. Now, Europeans, for their part, had a lot of trouble reconciling African legal concepts such as corporate land ownership as opposed to private land, pro private property. So, uh, and because that's a big part of European natural law as described by the, the church. And in fact, the Castilian Code of Laws, the, the Siete Partidas, argue that all land should have an owner. And if it did not, it ought to be owned by the state and then divvied up. So, needless to say, European visitors in Africa almost invariably refer to land as being all owned by one king or another. But unlike Europe, where taxes were levied upon land, in Africa, the kingdoms of Benin and Congo levied taxes not on land, but upon 
people. And to be honest, yeah, like I said earlier, you know, I'm not 100% sure that I should even really be calling some of these African rulers kings. Now, our sources do, but as I said, um, the early European sources on Africa didn't always understand how African legal and social structures worked, and so they often simply transposed European ideas onto these foreign states. Um, for example, John Hawkins, who is a British trader describing the Sierra Leone in the 1560s, said that nobles owned the land and everyone else had to pay rent. Yet later European residents who wrote of their time in Sierra Leone noted that these nobles, or salit salatiges, quote, did not obtain their territorial, territorial jurisdiction by hereditary, could not sell or alienate the land, and could not pass it on to their descendants, unquote. So it wasn't really their land. And the fact that Saltigues, excuse me for my terrible pronunciation, Saltigues were not nobles. In fact, they are not nobles. They were government officials. They were employed by the king and dismissible at will. And occasionally, dismissed Saltiges were actually able to seek employment and obtain income from another neighboring king. So Saltigues differed from European nobles in that they were granted revenue assignments rather than charged rents from land that they had grants to. Okay, now a similar system was in place on the African Gold Coast. There, Peasants and slaves had to work one day per week on land assigned to officials as part of the tax system. Likewise, the African kingdom of Luango had special fields set aside to support the nobility or state officials, and these were worked by peasants and slaves. In the state of Alada, the offices of tax collectors could be reassigned by the king upon the death of an official. The king then took half of the dead noble's wealth and property and divided the other half amongst the other nobility. Individual rights to property seem to have thus been quite limited in Alada. In Wari, which is a small state on the Niger River Delta, the king could replace members of the two governing councils at will when they died. Um, Benin's system of government worked similarly to this, John Thornton tells us, and in the Congo, state officials had no rights to income other than that assigned by the state, making the region similar to the Sierra Leone, and dismissed officials possessed no income at all. So, so it does seem to us that many African kingdoms featured a very powerful king, right? Well, maybe not, because while... As a result of all of this, some European observers believe that the king, or state, whatever the state ruler of Africa owned, and owned all the land and their, of their realm, it's more accurate, to quote John Thornton, quote, to see lands being owned by the state as a corporation, and the ruler is collecting income or acting as an official of the state, unquote. In Congo, for example, the king had vast powers, and often the king's successor was his son or brother. Yet ultimately, the choice of king lay in a group of electors who were stakeholders for the state. And this wasn't true for every African kingdom. Some were hereditary. And some of the elections were basically legal fictions and not true elections at all. But these ceremonies were still a necessary process in most, if not all, of the sub-Saharan African states. Now, one of Congo's neighbors was Ndongo, which seem to have had a somewhat stronger tradition of dynastic rule, but there, too, kings were checked by elections. Other regions had similar systems. In Biguba, a state on the coast of modern Guinea-Bissau, the executive was elected from among a group of related families called Jagras, and sometimes long civil wars were fought over the position. Some African states had, as part of their government, a system of checks and balances, in Sierra Leone, officials elected the ruler, but he in turn had the right to dismiss them at will upon his accession. The region around Accra and the Gold Coast had a similar process of election by officials who could then dismiss them. In Benin, succession was deemed hereditary, but the ruler's accession to the throne had to be confirmed and accepted by two senior officials. Excuse me. <clears throat> 
The king could appoint or dismiss these officials at will, and generally the kings of Menin chose foreign officials, which limited the ability of these two men to advance their own dynastic claims. But in other African states, these elections did not result in a strong executive or limited to, were limited to particular families. In many of the states on the Gold Coast, elections purposefully enthroned weak rulers, or rulers who could be easily checked by other state officials. Rulers on the Gold Coast were elected either by the people, that is, leading families, or by captains and other government officials. Similarly, the elections of the state of Gunala, another state on the coast of modern Guinea-Bissau, the electors there generally chose old and weak kings who would not challenge them. You know, within a state, Africans were free to cultivate any piece of land within their kingdom, and it was theirs for as long as they did so. But neither land nor title was passed down through hereditary lines, thus making slavery, as I said, the most important avenue for obtaining reproducible wealth in Africa. Now, since land was freely obtainable, Slavery in Africa functioned in two parallel ways in comparison to European slavery. First, slavery was much more widespread in Africa. But also, slaves were often treated no differently than peasant cultivators in Europe. Now, that certainly doesn't mean that no slaves in Africa received difficult, dangerous, or degrading work. Just that far fewer slaves in Africa did things like work on sugar mills or gold mines in comparison to slaves in European operations. Now, another way slavery within Africa differed from slavery in the Atlantic was that within Africa, slaves were used by state officials as a dependent and loyal group for both revenue production and for administrative and military service. Kings and other executives struggled for control of states, and other elite parties who sought to control royal absolutism, and thus the numerous slaves within Africa could be parlayed into leverage by kings. Um, and these slaves could also parlay that leverage uh, and making them quite powerful or wealthy over time. The empires of the Sudan, for example, relied upon slave armies and slave administrators, which kept fractious nobles in check. Ambitious commoners also accrued as many slaves as possible, since owning enough wealth in human capital meant that such a commoner might obtain nobility. Just as Europeans sought to obtain land and then nobility, Africans sought to obtain slaves and then nobility. And so slaves could be seen um, performing any number of duties or activities in Africa, and the designation of slave didn't necessarily mean that the person wasn't about to go knock on some nobleman's door and demand he pay his taxes at once. Now, so on the one hand, slaves in Africa were sometimes basically slaves in name only. Um, but on the other, they could also be obtained from the domestic slave markets of sub-Saharan Africa by anybody. So this did usually require royal or state permission from outsiders, such as the Portuguese, but Europeans willing to pay African taxes to African rulers were as able as anyone else to bargain with the wealthy merchants and state officials of Africa. The impact of African slave markets meeting with insatiable European demand can be clearly seen in the speed with which Africa began exporting slaves. The number doubled by the end of the 15th century. And so... We just we simply have to conclude that the African social and legal structures uh, in place in the 1400s, they're just as responsible for African participation in the slave trade as, as the conquistadors were. And people could become slaves in Africa in a variety of ways. Some were sold as a result of debt, others kidnapped by bandits. Jesuit observers commented in the 16th century that judicial enslavement as a result of trials was a common enough occurrence in the state of Ndongo in the Upper Guinea, um, but the most, by far, the most common method of obtaining slaves was military enslavement. Kadamastu states this is true of Joloff when he visited in 1455 and notes that most of the slaves were captured in wars. Successful kings or other African warlords might then integrate their captives into the domestic co co uh, excuse me, economy or sell them, traditionally to Muslim traders for the Saharan trade, although by the 1450s also to Christians. 
Now, I think it is important to note here that Sub-Saharan Africa only really contained um, the largest of states, what, what I guess what historians would call empires, in the Sudanic regions of Africa. Because there, control of the rich river valleys of the western and central Sudan enabled control of the vast trans-Saharan trade networks. South of the Sudan, Africa was much more politically fragmented. On the lower Niger River Valley, states like Congo, Nupe, Igala, and the Benin, these were all states about the size of England or Portugal. But many states were much smaller than this. Some even smaller than some American counties, maybe the area occupied by a larger city. And populations of these states could vary considerably. Maybe as few as three to 5,000 individuals might comprise a microstate in the more sparsely populated regions of Central Africa. But a similarly sized microstate on the densely inhabited Slave Coast or Gold Coast might contain 20 or 30,000. Now, virtually all the land from the Gambia River along the coast to the Niger Delta was in states of this small size. And, and you can look at, and, and really, the, the maps from Thornton that I've put up are very illuminating. And, and, and so was a lot of the land stretching into the interior was, was set up like this. So looking at that, knowing that, it, it seems clear that African rulers just weren't focused on the enlargement of their geographical borders, which is probably a result of Africans not having land as private property. And so the politics of sub-Saharan Africa was in a bit of stark contrast to the politics of Europe and Asia. There, political uh, power depended on the ability of rulers to grant land to their followers. African states were not interested in acquiring land. It was freely available. Instead, they acquired slaves. And the African system of human-based instead of land-based power wasn't without advantages either. Military conquest of land required administration of larger areas and the expansion of military resources, whereas the acquisition of slaves required shorter campaigns that did not need to create new administrative centers to be successful. Now, along the riverine systems of West Africa, small raids by canoe made possible attacks that could move silently and strike suddenly, sometimes at night, um, carrying people off into slavery. The Faloup people, for example, became infamous for carrying out these sorts of raids on a regular basis uh, by the 15th century. And the inhabitants of the Bisagos Islands also became infamous for their naval attacks on the African mainland in the 16th century. Slaves were taken in this way by rulers of small states of the area to increase their personal dependence and thus strengthen their power base, or by aristocrats, merchants, or other private citizens in order to do the same thing. And this resulted in an enormous slave population in Africa at the time of the arrival of Europeans, which and this included the necessary legal institutions and material resources to support large slave markets, one that anyone could participate in, including Europeans or other foreigners. And indeed, it is exactly why the number of African merchants who dealt in slaves was so large. You know, and the importance of domestic slavery in Africa was paramount in African politics. And, and so decisions concerning which slaves to sell to Europeans and when, and for how much, and how many slaves were to be sold, all of these questions, these are firmly in the hands of African elites. This can be made perfectly clear by viewing how African states participated in the slave trade. In Benin, slaves were available to the Portuguese, and slaves of Beninese descent appear in Europe by the early 16th century. But as early as 1520, Benin began to restrict the slave trade and cut it off by 1550, according to Alan Ryder, author of Benin and the Europeans. Congo, too, was a major exporter of slaves to the Portuguese, but stopped selling them in the late 16th century. So neither of these states seems to have been impelled by pressure, either commercial or military, to continue trading in slaves. The many states of the Gold Coast region in Africa did not participate in the slave trade immediately, or for the first 150 years of trade with Europe, despite substantial trade in slaves taking place elsewhere. In fact, the states of the Gold Coast had large domestic enslaved populations 
and were perhaps less willing to export slaves. In fact, often these states imported slaves from their neighbors and from the Portuguese to meet their own domestic labor, paying for slaves with gold. Finally, if we take a close look um, at how African warfare operated in the 15th century and on into the 17th century, um, we can see how military technology, European military technology, really reaches its limits in Africa. Now, Europeans participated in Europe, African warfare, and African rulers uh, engaged with European military experts and advisors, uh, occasionally uh, hiring them as armed mercenaries. But in the 16th and 17th centuries, the military assistance which Europeans could give Africans isn't really enough to provide any decisive advantages that would mean European arms could impel African rulers to continue selling slaves in what historians have called a gun slave or horse slave cycle. And this is, I guess, the last um, theory we're going to look at, hypothesis that we're going to look at uh, before we go on to what I think is really going on. Now, at any rate, now, okay, so as far as the gun, slave, and horse slave cycle, now for one thing, horses. Horses and cattle don't do well in areas of Africa where the tsetse fly lives. These animals are very susceptible to sleeping sickness. Uh, and secondly, much of the Sudanese region of Africa, where cavalry raids were a much larger part of warfare and slave taking, were, was already capable of breeding a fairly large number of horses by the 14th century, and were even trading these horses south to warlords uh, to, in, in need of mounts. So, I, I don't think it's fair to see that, say that Africans uh, were selling slaves because they needed horses. And neither did they need European armor. For starters, in what the Portuguese call Guinea, it is simply far too hot to walk around wearing metal armor all day. You will die. At any rate, Africans were capable of fashioning their own armor, and they preferred to do so out of other materials. Zerara tells us that when the con Portuguese conquistador Lancerot makes his second expedition into Africa in the 1440s, some of the men entered a hut where they found a black shield made of hide, quite round in shape, which had in the middle of it the same hide as the shield itself, to wit, an elephant's ear. Afterwards, they learned from other Africans they met that the elephant hide was a preferred material for shields since it was so much thicker than was necessary. Now, firearms are even more problematic. These are obviously dangerous missile weapons, and were so back in the day, but they were designed to counteract armored cavalry and for naval warfare in Europe's temperate climates. They had great range and penetrating power, but also a slow rate of fire and they suffered far greater rates of misfire in Africa's tropical climate as a result of humidity than they did in Europe. Now, in Europe, firearms, in the early modern firearms misfired about one in seven shots. Now, I personally, though, have experienced days in Savannah, Georgia, where the humidity was up around 100%, the air literally feels so heavy, that flintlock muskets will not fire. And mind you, the musket technology of the 15th and 16th century was less capable of later flintlocks. Um, and so I don't... Well, at any rate, firearms weren't very popular uh, um, amongst the, the, the Africans, to be perfectly honest, um, even though they understood... Uh, how dangerous they could be on occasion um, until until far later. European ships, too, were only supplementary. As we talked about, they could be quite helpless when close to shore. And in some parts of West Africa, like Benin, earthwork fortifications instead of wooden or stone palisades meant that the artillery aboard the caravels was practically meaningless in a siege. Now, looking all, at all of this, that we can see that while Europeans did participate in African wars and slave raids, they did not bring about any sort of military revolution exactly that forced participation in the Atlantic trade as a price to pay for survival. In contrast, African participation in the slave trade was voluntary and, as we've said, further under the control of Africans. And not just on the surface, but at these deeper levels, Europeans just simply don't possess the means to force African leaders to sell slaves. So 
Given the internal dynamics involved in the history of Africa's domestic slave market, as well as the history of the trans-Saharan slave trade, it's easy to see how and why, I think, African leaders were willing and able to respond to European demands for slaves. Um, and, and one thing, one other thing, but gosh, I kind of skipped over the horses a little bit already. Um, these horses and cattle, the difference between Africa and Europe a lot, these horses and cattle require so much extra land for pasture um, and that, 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 that can't be used by humans. And so this idea of land as property, I think, kind of comes from people living with horses and cattle more. And that doesn't happen as much in, in sub-Saharan Africa, obviously. They keep dying of sleeping sickness. And people just, the reason that there's so much free land available is just that people, simply put, do not require these giant pieces of tracts of land that these large uh, animals, horses and cows, need. So, anyway. You know what the problem with rich people is? You know, the, the problem with rich people is that they're people. Now, I don't remember where I heard that exactly, but the point of the saying, I think, is that people are selfish. Now, so with that in mind, I hope you didn't come into this episode like I came into doing the research for it. Essentially looking for heroes. I don't know why. Maybe my own naivety. Perhaps my own misconceptions about Africans. You know, in studying the politics and economics of Africa, we def find that despite the seemingly near limitless thirst with which European conquistadors seek to enslave whatever unfortunate Europeans they might find in capture, Africans were fully able to prevent Portuguese, the Portuguese and other uh, Europeans from establishing anything but little toeholds on uninhabited islands of coastline. But these same would-be conquistadors returned to Europe with many, many, many more slaves as a result of this legitimate commerce that grew out of the peace, that grew out of the peace than they had been getting via, I guess, what I'm going to call the Norman method. So now that we know the African background that precedes the creation of the Atlantic world, I guess I can finally answer the question of how and why. Slave markets developed in Africa, which drew the conquistadors towards them. Which, paradoxically, answering that question has left me with other questions that history normally answers. For example, who opened the first slave markets in Africa? Who is the African Henrique? The specifics of who, where, and when these markets opened is, is known maybe only to prehistory. But at least we understand how and why. Because if we're going to understand how slavery worked in Africa, I guess we really only needed to understand the dynamics of the relationship between horses, land, slaves, and the tsetse fly. So, um, one last thing I want to mention, uh, I have some closing thoughts. I, I believe I have a pretty good understanding now, and I hope you do too, of how slavery came to become a larger part of sub-Saharan Africa's political economy. John Thornton was only, I think, hinting at it a bit. Um, but, you know, it's, it's funny to me how, how so much of human history, I think, has to do with other organisms, animals and plants that, that aren't human beings. Animals like this land and horses, they require land for pasturage. And because these animals fall victim to sleeping sickness carried by the tsetse fly, Demand for land in sub-Saharan Africa never reached anything what it did in Eurasia, or North Africa, or the Mediterranean, or in the Sudan. As a result, elites in Africa have historically, and, and probably prehistorically, had far less incentive to collect land, which was useful in the north because it could be converted to pasturage, and more incentive instead to own tax rights on subjects. Markets followed, I'm sure, after this. Power structures also. And in a final analysis, we can see Africans weren't forcibly enslaved by Europeans en masse because they were somehow less civilized or more savage than Europeans. But neither were they less savage. Perhaps, in fact, no men are more noble than others. 
except by noble deeds. I came into this podcast searching for for heroes. I didn't I didn't really find any. I just found villains. Did some more research, I found some more villains, and eventually I realized that the world is so full of villainy that I should have been spending more time looking for the heroes. That's a far rarer quality discovering people. That message, though, applies equally today as it does in the 1400s, mind you. Evil is just a part of human nature. I guess I like heroes so much because they... They challenge us to confront our human nature. And they force us to realize that the nature of evil might be inside of us. The nature of heroism is not. It is to challenge ourselves to do better, to be better than we are. And as I started thinking about that, I wonder, well, how could I? How could I do that? Well, it occurred to me, as it would occur, I think, to any child of the 80s, suddenly an important message from an albeit imperfect messenger just kind of came to me. So right now, I'm staring at the man in the mirror, and I'm asking him to change his ways. No message could be any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. Evil, part of human nature, often appears when we are greedy. Sometimes it appears when we're being, just all we have to do is be selfish. It always shows up when we are unkind. Sometimes, evil can appear even when all we are is tired, or busy, or not paying enough attention. It exists in all of us. It manifests at different times in different amounts. Sometimes, even silence can be evil. Now, I normally save my politics about talking uh, for talking about centuries past. Now, I love my history, and I promise to mostly do that. But there are times when we are called upon to do good. Putting migrant children into concentration camps, is a shameful thing. I find it especially shameful. I believe in the ideals of the United States. The cost of securing the border for this country cannot be the American soul. Now, I'm really glad, I guess, if President Trump decides to stop putting these children in concentration camps in the future. But even said, that still leaves a lot of kids who need help. Now, it doesn't matter to me how you feel about whether or not they should be let into the country or not. You only have two choices when someone knocks on your door. You can let them in, or you can tell them to go away. You can't stuff them in the basement. And so, if no man is more noble except by noble deeds, then I would ask for you to do something noble or heroic. A few days ago, I guess I did. I'm not going to brag, but I was proud to make like Spider-Man and call my congressman Mike Kaufman. I demanded that he do whatever he could to help those kids. His phone number is 202-225-7882. I welcome you to also call Mike Kaufman, although if you are not living in Colorado's 6th sixth di- sixth district, it might actually be best to call your own congressman. If you don't know how, don't feel bad. I didn't, but it's actually really looked up. It's really easy to look up. I just uh, did a quick Google search, typed in my zip code, and there I had it. So, if you could take some time and call your congressperson today, I want you to know you'd really be a hero. So, anyway, until later on, when we return with uh, Zarara and Katamasto, uh, I'll be... Doing, finishing up that episode in a couple of days here and actually re, uh, be putting that one out uh, later on this week. Um, anyway, have a great day. So long, and thanks for all the fish.
listen what I say. The captain is a tyrant and I no longer obey. I'm sick of taking orders from the madman in command. So let's drop him on an island and leave him in the sand. Cause it's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. And now we're taking over the ship. It's a mutiny. Ship. Hey, mighty captain, haven't you heard what's happening here? You're no longer in control, and we're drinking up your beer. This is now a democratic, eagerly tearing pirate ship. So enjoy your trip. It's a mutiny. It's a mutiny. This is a mutiny. And now we're taking over the ship. 